You know, every once in a while, life serves you a delicious piece of peanut butter pie. And by peanut butter pie, I don't actually mean peanut butter pie. I mean, I've got the entire house to myself this Saturday night. Kristen and Dame, you're not invited over. But Dame, when's the last time you had for an entire weekend night, the entire compound to yourself and you could do whatever you wanted? uh it probably i mean i know one night specifically uh, about a year ago exactly when mm. the fam was in uh, a different city for a swim weekend and i couldn't attend because i had covid again mm. Mm. uh so th <laughs> that wasn't quite as enjoyable no. as is what you're uh, what you're describing but i would say there was probably uh, a swim related event yeah. that i was left at home for in the last six months uh and it's it is a unique feeling well, I'm at full strength. Kristen, I want to tell you what a, a gentleman of my ilk might do on a Saturday night. Okay. All, the world is my oyster. Because, I mean, look, there's options, Dame. Well, like, uh, Mrs. Planner and, and uh, uh, my daughter are in a different state. Theodore is a sleepover. Like, I could go out to eat by myself. I could go see a mm -hmm. movie. Mm -hmm. Here's what I'm going to do. <laughs> I'm going to watch the new Roadhouse on mm -hmm. Amazon Prime. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to make Detroit style pizza. Oh, that's what I'm doing. That's my Saturday night. I'm so excited. Um, what are you going to pair with that pizza? Good question. Uh, I'm also going to make chicken wings. <laughs> 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 and probably consume a Bev. I, it sounds like a great night. I know you kind of want to come over. Like I, Dave, I know I'm not fun to hang out with and, and, and you know that too, but you kind of want to come over. I, it would be great to eat pizza and wings and share a Bev and sit on the couch and not say a word to each other watching oh, Roadhouse. Okay. Kristen, I am not officially in a creepy way inviting you over to my home alone this Saturday <laughs> night, <laughs> just for the record. Got it. But it doesn't sound at all appealing to sit and watch Roadhouse, the remake and eat Detroit style pizza and wings and Bev's on Saturday night. You guys, I can do that <laughs> any Friday or Saturday night. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. <laughs> okay. Yes. All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, full squad back, right? Uh, the gender episode uh, was a hit last week. I got some, some positive emails. We got some dissenting mm -hmm. opinions from people, which is great. Like, look, you know. We love it, right, Dame? Yeah, I wasn't here, so way to go, guys. Way to way to stir up some controversy while I'm going. Dame, did you catch any of it? No. Good. Perfect. <laughs> uh, we did receive a, a review on iTunes here recently. True. And, and to be Dame, you don't read the reviews anymore, do you? Or are you? No, I, I mean, I'm, you, I'm way past that. Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> I <laughs> I never read the reviews. I don't actually care. But Kristen is still in the stage of her media career in which she reads the reviews. And uh, she sent the following one through from last month. I've been tuning in to financial podcasts for several years now. And let me tell you, most of them are as fresh as week old bread, recycled topics and ads galore. But then there's the PTP show, the Seinfeld of personal finance podcasts. <laughs> it's about nothing. And that's what makes it gold. Sure, they throw in some solid financial info and banter, but what I really sh what really shines are the hosts. Peter's humor. What is it? My mom write this? Yeah. Peter's humor is so suburban dad, it's practically wearing socks with sandals. <laughs> Dame's got that high class redneck vibe going strong. <laughs> I don't hate it. And Kristen? Well, she's the glue holding these two together, keeping them from bickering over who had the better hairline in their glory days. That's really well written. Uh, we can we can squash that debate immediately. It it, it was you. I'm I would be shocked <laughs> if it wasn't you that had the better hairline. Uh, back in the day, yeah. I think I I liked my hair when I had it. Oh well, anyway, yeah. yeah. We can start calling Kristen Elmer. Yeah, Elmer's glue, glue. or uh, rubber cement. <laughs> oh my. Uh, okay. I did write a, G a, a, a uh, AI uh, inspired theme to the radio show this week, but we're in a hurry. We got to go. I have to be out of here in 50 minutes total, and I've just burned the extra four minutes. We're going to start <laughs> the show next week, maybe 
I'll play the new theme song to the show. Uh, it's called Kristen and Co. <laughs> okay, start your clocks, lady and gentlemen. In three, two, one. This week on the Pete the Planner Show, we answer your money questions. Here's how the show works. You email us, askpete at petetheplanner.com. That's askpete at petetheplanner.com. And here's, there, there's a number of things that could happen. As, as often happens when an email is sent into the nethers, uh, nothing could happen. Or it could be read on a moderately popular radio show and a wildly popular podcast called the Pete the Planner Show. Hello, Damian Dunn. Hello. Hello, Peter Dunn. Hello, Kristen Elanius. Hello. Hello. I've got the caffeine in the right spot mm. right now. Let's do a show. Hey, Dame, this week in the news, this isn't the news segment, but guess what happened? The real estate market got turned on its head forever in perpetuity, which is, I guess, I believe that means forever. Dame, how closely did you follow the real estate upheaval that was the last two weeks of life in America. It's been a story that we've been following for a while because we saw this coming from a, a ways away. And it's interesting because I, depending on which avenue you're getting your information from, you either hear that this is going to be an absolute disaster or it's going to open up a lot of opportunities for, uh, for buyers and sellers as well. So I don't know where I stand on it just yet. I, and I'm not entirely sure how it's going to get implemented across the country as well, because NAR doesn't cover every realtor in America. Most. most. Like, like, like most. A lot. Yeah. So, so here's the news tidbit. Uh, the uh, uh, National Association of Realtors uh, in a settlement have now are, are, have agreed to not price fix uh, commission rates at 6%. That They are negotiable. This is a massive deal that has frozen out people's ability to truly negotiate in good faith the amount they pay to realtors for these transactions. Before we discuss this, I mean, we got to hit the got to hit the the obvious here. We have nothing against realtors. Realtors are great. Like it's true, I find them to be one of the most important types of financial advisors a person can have. But this is going to rock things up. Kristen, you recently purchased a home of which you are in right now. Yes. And you used a realtor. I did. Do you know what percentage you paid? I didn't because I was the buyer. Okay, fair. Yes. <laughs> Splitting hairs to a bald man is always a good time. But you uh, do realize that, of course, there was commission on the deal and the the, the seller uh, had to deal with that. Do you know that what that percentage was? I believe that it was five. Okay. So two and a half to two and a half. I would assume would have been the split two and a half to the buyer's agent, two and a half to the seller's agent. Six has been the standard for a while. It was seven. So Dane, what we're now understanding is there's going to be a race to the bottom. I mean, you could find people trying to do high volume at 1%. What, what do you, what do you think is going to happen here? Yeah, it sure feels like it. And I, I, it depends on, are we going to see specialists for certain things? Are we going to see sellers agents that, that try and specialize in that? Are we going to see buyers agents specifically? Like, Maybe, maybe they set up a, a menu of services that they could provide for their clients on the buyer side. You can pick and choose and pay uh, directly because it's very possible that when the seller puts this out there, they say, I'm not giving anything to the buyer's agent. And to make their services a little bit more accessible for their clients, maybe they choose to just kind of do flat rate stuff instead of percentages. I, I think there's going to be some very unique solutions that are developed in the coming years in this area. And we're only going to see the tip of the iceberg. Kristen, you had some pretty hot takes at the, uh, your Moneyline headquarters this week when you journeyed down this way and I saw you and you got pretty spicy with it. Um, Care to share your thoughts, especially as it relates to uh, when you're purchasing a home? Yeah, I think it's the thing that's hard for me is as someone who is an avid researcher in I have bought and sold both. I've lived in a couple different houses and as an avid researcher, I felt like my ability to bring a lot to those conversations wasn't compensated for or wasn't taken into consideration with the compensation model. My uh, The home that I purchased most recently, I did 
the majority of that research. Mm. And that wasn't reflected in what the seller then paid, in my opinion. So that's where I kind of have an issue with it from a personality perspective. At the closing of the purchase of the home, you didn't like get in people's face and say, do your research or anything like that. <laughs> did you? No, I did not. <laughs> Dame, what I think is possible here, and this is just a, I mean, this is a, a gut feeling. I think what's going to happen is, there's going to be these tranches of home prices and it are going to be standard deviations of what the average home price in America or in an area is. So let's just pick, let's say $500,000 is the average price of a home in America. Dame, I think it's in like the 400 range, but whatever. Mm -hmm. I think because there is a pool of properties and a pool of buyers, a marketplace that can come together in a, and create that as the average transaction price, I think that there'll be like a one or 2% commission on that. And as things move from the standard deviation out, that's where you're going to see increased fees because it is theoretically more difficult at those price levels. I have no idea what I'm talking about, but I am wearing a sport coat today. What, <laughs> what, what say you? It's an interesting theory. I mean, you're essentially saying that there's going to be breakpoints almost for uh, charges or commissions in real estate, much like there are in, in some retail mutual funds, which I, I, I guess I could see that. My, my counterpoint would be, you know, we've talked about how financial advisors are compensated every which way on this show multiple times. Do you think there gets a point where some realtors just say, I've got a flat fee, uh, all of this, all in, flat fee, and I don't care if you're selling your home for $300,000 or $750,000, this is what it costs to engage me to sell your home. Well, Kristen, I mean, we've been having this discussion for as long as we've known each other collectively, the three of us. Uh, the reason that hasn't been the case is because it hasn't had to be the case. And for financial advisors, that was the argument for a very long time of like, yeah, you could do that, but that's not what the market supports. Just <laughs> charge 75 basis points or a a point on, or I mean, a, a hundred basis points on 5 million bucks and there's your comp. Yeah. And what's interesting is there's a parallel here for me from a money psychology perspective, mm -hmm. which is that the fees that are paid are just like, part of the overall package. Like when you're selling your house, you don't have to write a check to the realtor for 5%. It's like, oh, here's what you made and here's what you owed and here's some taxes that needed to be paid and, 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 and then here's your check or here's the amount that we're going to give for the new house for this mortgage. I just feel like the conversation is totally different if you make a seller write you a check for the commission. Dame, do you think this lowers housing prices no <laughs> i agree i agree okay so i was listening to the new york times podcast this week about this and they were like well people typically increase the price of the home by six percent to cover real estate uh fees and i'm like no they don't I, I i don't believe that's true new york times no, I've never heard somebody say, well, we were going to sell our house for $300,000, but our realtor said, we need to bump this up just a little bit to make sure we cover yeah. all the associated fees. No. 318. They, 318. Yeah. <laughs> they come back and they say, this is what the market's going to hold for this house. Don't mind these other fees that are over there. They, of course, they don't say that, but that's just it. That's not a consideration. People keep asking, we're on a live stream right now and I am dressed in a nice sport coat and people keep asking like, is there a funeral? Do I have a job interview? Am I selling a house later? Here's the thing. And it's just the truth. I have a business meeting with a gentleman this afternoon who happens to always be very well dressed. and He's a lot more handsome than me. So I just had to do the best I could to match it with the dressing, obviously. All right, Dame, um, one year from now, what do you believe the average real estate commission to be? Uh, all in, all in four and a half. Kristen, four, three. <laughs> Listen, we're going to come back with more of this show right after the commercial. And what it's going to be is an email from a listener. Could be you, might not be you. Ask Pete at PeteThePlanner.com. I'm Pete the Planner. Okay. That was a good outro. I liked that. You did? Yeah. Thank I wish you. I could play the, oh, let me see if I can play the, uh, I'm going to play it. Okay. The theme song? Yeah, it's uh, it's going to be weird audio because I wanted to hook it up, but and I don't have time for this, but what are you going to do?
uh here it is uh was it the twangy one yes yeah. okay, here <laughs> everybody that town is gonna be the old man home it's a show called christian and go this and that clean damien ball and grouchy but this is the star young young and sassy so a ai wrote that <laughs> completely wrote that I, I i just filled in a few details and it wrote it did you call me sassy or did ai just assume that's a great question um <laughs> i'm just curious you know what let me see i don't let me see country <laughs> song about the pete the planner podcast the show should be called Kristen and co because Kristen is the star <laughs> damien and pete are old grumpy bald men Kristen is young and smart those are my instructions so it just nailed it. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, let's get back to the show. Uh, we're doing the email from what's her name? Barbara Clarity. Martha. Martha. Sure. sure. Okay. Three, two, one. Back on the Pete the Planner show, answering your money questions. Sometimes. Uh, we received an email this week from the most important listener we have. That person's name is. What's the, what's the person's name? Martha. Martha. Never forget it. <laughs> Sorry. I'm having a weird mood. Dear Pete, Kristen, and Dame. Time out. Granted. Dame, I really the other day talking, I was talking about you. And I called you Damien to something. Really? What? And it like shook me to my core. Because no one be calls you that in this organization. Anymore. I say it had to be outside of our organization because the I mean I, I've I was, I've told the people this story many times. Before working for your money line, I could count on one hand the number of people that have ever called me Dame in my life. Yeah. And now there are people that don't know me by anything other than Dame. <laughs> it's so weird. Uh, tens of thousands of people. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my sister Patricia is a faithful listener. She has me hooked on your show. Uh, not only because I appreciate your humor, but the easiness associated with the feedback you all approach financial topics. I'm using my sister's email uh, to ask since you've responded to her before. My question is, I am 60 years old, retired medical doctor with a pension and no outstanding debt. I wonder if she's single because that is great. <laughs> 60 retired. I'm considering, I am not single by the way. I, I might be after this show. I am considering a second home. However, it is a good decision. Uh, is it a good decision to finance a second home? Well, can I get another timeout? Sure. When I first got my head around as a kid that people could have multiple uh, properties, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? You sort of figure you're like, oh, they have two homes. For whatever reason, just like I used to think I use uh, mascot was a cactus, uh, <laughs> for whatever reason, I thought that people would just accumulate homes next to each other. So it's like, they, oh, oh, we have one home. Oh, I have two homes. And then you would just walk to the next door to your other home. I didn't realize that the concept was to have homes in different places. Eventually, you just have a block. You probably got that from Monopoly. That's what I was just thinking. You know what? That has to be it. But now it turns out I have one of the world's foremost experts on money. I'm considering a second home. My primary home is paid off five years ago, and I placed the mortgage payments on a high yield at the time money market account at 5%. Each payment I've rounded up to two grand a month. Uh, right now, the money market holds about 125 grand, uh, which I plan on using as a down payment for the second home. I don't have children, and I'm a, I'm a widow. I have a small foundation that supports research. Time out. Uh, you've got to be careful with this. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Kristen does research. Yes. She, I mean, Kristen, are you involved with this research foundation? In the last segment, you were talking about all the research you do. I'm not involved with this foundation, no. Um, this person has a small foundation that supports research, and she's a former... Like, this is a remarkable human. 
it really sounds like something that you would aspire to later in your life. The, the Peter Dunn Foundation, or what would your foundation be called? What would it be called? Uh, it wouldn't be your namesake. No, probably not. I no. would call it something like, I don't know. Anyway, Thanks. I've always dreamed of a second home, but work was always a priority. Now it's feasible for me to make that dream come true. Uh, the home I'm looking at will be a small cabin of 950 square feet, which will cost upon completion of $380,000. I can't imagine the real estate fees on that. Please make some options as to what a 60-year-old woman uh, should do to finance a second home, where there are other options I should consider. Thanks, Martha. This is phenomenal. I did hear a thing that this person said that this is her dream. It was a movie I was watching. They said, when you're 50, you don't have dreams anymore. You have nightmares and psoriasis, which I thought was a funny line. <laughs> but anyway, um, what do you think, y'all? Man, I think there's two different things here. Can Martha finance a house? And is Martha going to be comfortable financing a house? Martha, there are so many things that happen in our financial lives that whether we want them to or not lower our gut for risk. I think having a pension just lowers your gut for risk. Like you just can't help it. And not having a mortgage just like reduces your risk tolerance. You just can't help it. And I wonder how someone in this position would feel without earned income specifically to say, now I have a liability when I haven't had one for that's five an, years. It's an interesting point. I mean, you proposed that having fixed income mm -hmm. lowers your appetite for risk. Hmm. I don't know if I agree. I uh, agree with Dame disagreeing with Chris. What? Yeah, yeah, we're all, we're all closer to having a pension. I mean, we don't <laughs> have them, but we're old. <laughs> Yeah, Dame, I, I agree with you. If I if I if I know that my the food's going to be on the table day in day out, and there's going to be a roof over my head, regardless of what I do, I'm probably going to be more comfortable taking some swings because it doesn't matter. A bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. Sure. What? <laughs> it's an old saying. <laughs> you never heard that saying? I yeah. I have. Okay, but, <laughs> but <laughs> we're trying to do a show here, gentlemen. Oh. But I are you too biased because you're personal finance experts? Is that actually true to the masses? Think about the people we work with that have fixed incomes, that have pensions, are taking social security, who like I don't think that that's true in mass. Uh, okay. So we focus on people's stability around here at your money line. And so mm -hmm. if, if that's the argument of people trying to find stability, that's one thing. But what a pension brings that not having a pension doesn't is certainty. And I believe certainty to be more valuable than stability um, when it comes to a person's retirement. So I don't I mean, Dave and I can certainly articulate our comfort with a pension in that regard. But I think other people might just feel it and might not be able to put into words what it is that makes them feel good about their financial life. I, I don't know. What what do I know? I mean, I know a lot, but <laughs> what what Dame knows a lot. <laughs> Wait, let's answer her question. How about this? Yes. Should she when she said 950 square foot cabin, I'm in. The, my buddy, uh, friend of the show, Neil, he has like a 300 square foot cabin in the woods that is the most glorious place on the earth it is it smells of whiskey and old records and and i it is the gl most glorious place on the earth i want uh martha to get a small cabin that's what i want <laughs> regardless <laughs> whether it's fine it right just, yeah. yeah so i default to yes is anyone gonna ruin martha and i's dream here <laughs> No, I, I oh. no, no. If if the numbers work out and she is is fine with it, I I think I think she should do it. I think she should do it too. And here's the thing: let's say it goes wrong, just sell it. I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> and and the commission on that's going to be really dirt cheap. Yeah. Oh my, I think this is much more about an a, a money 
an emotional weight that we put on money more than anything else Mm -hmm. and how we go from accumulation of money to then having to come away from those dollars and changing the structure of presumably for the last five years, her financial reality has been pretty consistent and this is a change. We just have to prepare ourselves for change. Um, But I absolutely think that Martha should do this. 60. The other thing, here's the other thing that 60 is young. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm enjoy your life you have a dream you've been a medical doctor you have a foundation think of yourself go go do it now we can't say this to everyone who emails us because the circumstances don't dictate it but like yolo that's what i'm saying (laughs) like come on i i I so badly want this to happen because there's another way out of it if it goes wrong that's the thing it's not a permanent like you don't ruin your financial life by doing this All right, let's take a break. Coming back after the break, more on the Pete the Planner Show. I'm Pete the Planner. Slack channel's lighting up. I wasn't ready for it. Oh, I have my mute notifications. Oh, I never do. Me me too. Yeah. What are you guys doing? Trying to pay attention to the show. show. (laughs) That was, we were both a little hot on that. (laughs) We're paying attention. (laughs) Okay. Okay. Um, Dame Pete, I was talking to Mrs. Planner last night, talking about like the things we've upcoming in the next month and a half, and the, we have to go to a, a black tie event at the end of April. Mm-hmm. No. Um, and I said, "Oh, yeah, we got that." So I'm going to need to get my tuxedo, mm-hmm. um, shape changed. Sure. <laughs> And and she's like, oh, really? Why? She made me say it. She made me say because I look like I've been rotting on a southern beach like a like a like a sperm whale, like a like a a, a bloated, gassy sperm whale. Uh And that's my that's my carcass now of which I'm going to have to stretch fine fabrics over. And I need. I need to alter the shape of the tuxedo. Just don't let anybody with sharp implements get close to you. Exactly. Um, so, I, I mean, there's something humbling about taking in a tuxedo to be largened. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we got to go. In three, two, one. Back on the Pete the Planner show... Oh, I don't know why I said it like that. We had another question come in this week from a human non sentient being. Uh, I've been an avid listener for years, and I've always appreciated the practical and empathetic advice you give. Recently, I found myself in a challenging situation and thought this might be something you could address on the show. I was very unexpectedly laid off from my job. And while um, time out. Ooh, Dame uh, Very what? was bolded. Okay, I don't oh, know, you're just right. like I mean, very and, and how very was it? Very, very. like that's. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, the uncertainty of it feels like I'm making fun of this person by saying that because they're about to talk about job loss. So mm. I re- I regret pointing the time time out towards that. The uncertainty of how long it will take to find a new position is daunting. What steps should I take to manage my finances during this period of unemployment? What can I do now to position myself better for the future? I love this question. Sorry, I made a joke. Kristen, <laughs> how how do you begin to attack this? Well, there's always a lot in the unsaid as we we discuss on this show. And someone who bolds very and saying they were very unexpectedly laid off from their job. I have concerns about what level of emergency savings are here. Okay. Hmm. Oh. Oh. Dame, I'm so glad we went to her. Uh, Had you picked (laughs) up on that as well? No. (laughs) No. Wow. You're so right. The person was shocked because they were unprepared. Right. Okay, so this is a this is a how do you dig out of a hole and everything feels dark and there's not a lot of hope. 
Potentially. I mean, maybe they're an avid listener. Maybe they take our advice about the importance of emergency funds. Or maybe what's probably more true is that we see this all the time on at Your Money Line is someone says, in a perfect world, I would have more in emergency savings, but I feel really secure. So I have a lower level because I feel like my gut for risk in this respective is pretty high. And I would assume based on some of this language that that's what we're experiencing is someone who maybe has like one or two months of emergency savings and they knew they probably should have had three to six, but they felt really secure where they were at and they had other goals they wanted to achieve. Dame, how do you view this? Um, I first, I, I'm just tickled that that Kristen is now reading into questions the way that we. <laughs> it's it's beautiful. I, I love uh, that. She's great. We really ruined her. Yeah. Great. They're just making wild assumptions based on very little yeah. knowledge. It's it's great with it's, bold it's, font. With bold a font. bold font. She's like, you know what? I bet this person's a German. It's like <laughs> what? How <laughs> how did you get that? Like four like, well, it's Helvetica. Very, four four very dark letters change <laughs> everything. Um. I um I think that this individual is probably unprepared, but they have an opportunity to become very, very familiar in dark, even very in dark, bold font, familiar with how much money they're spending on a week in, week out basis, because you don't have a lot of levers that you can pull right now. But that is one to some degree that you have complete control over how much money you're spending. And if you ask, if you're asking the question, what can you do now to position yourself better for the future? That's it. That is one of the takeaways that you can walk away from this experience with becoming intimately familiar with how you spend money, where you spend money, how much you need to live on in a, we'll go ahead and call it a crisis situation for you. Now that doesn't necessarily help the immediacy of the income issue, but it will certainly stretch those savings that you have set aside as long as you possibly can. Here's where my brain goes, and it's probably the wrong spot. And and please, both of you, beat this up. Prepare. First off, um, I don't know. I can't conceive of this being a reality for me. I'm just being honest. And, and in a couple different ways. Number one, uh, I'm my own employer. <laughs> Number two, um, I have an emergency savings and my, the brain that I have that goes to solve this problem would also be the one that has theoretically an emergency savings. So that that's where it's already off the rails. But if I'm, I'm in this situation, I think I would go and get a job immediately just earning something. And this isn't like, go drive Uber, drive DoorDash, and I don't know why I use that voice. I, I think it is, I would just go find a job somewhere. Just earning something. Is that not a thing people do? How out of touch is the old man today? <laughs> <laughs> That's really interesting because something that I noted in my pre-show prep was social comparison or pressure to find a job quickly. Because if you're someone who wasn't expecting job loss, you might not have been perusing opportunities that you could be a good fit for. You might not even have a gauge on whether your comp was competitive or not, for better or worse. You might not know how many opportunities do or don't exist. And I think about like for this is different because I could see myself in this situation. I just messaged Pete yesterday on Slack and was like, if you're firing me, I'm busy. <laughs> so this is like a constant fear I of mine. I just wanted to chat. <laughs> you know, I are you available? About, I was like, hey, are you available? I wanted to talk about work. She's like, if you're firing me, I'm not available. And I'm like, okay, what do we do? <laughs> I'm not firing. I just, I wanted to talk about a project. So, so that's like a constant fear of mine, right? Like it doesn't matter how many times someone could tell me that I'm doing a good job. Like I'm always like thinking what could happen. So I think like, okay, what if I like had a, a weekly dinner with like my parents or something like Sunday brunch and every Sunday they're asking me, Kristen, did you find a job yet? Kristen, did you find a job yet? The hiring process isn't sure. Like even if you're any job that you're applying for could take four, six weeks for you to be hired at. And I think that that social pressure of like, have you figured out the next step? There's shame that comes with that. We're talking about the next potential launch point of a career. If you're someone who is like really like career focused, you're talking about your next launch point. So I think that that's a hard thing to navigate. 
I, I don't think that's exactly where Pete was going with it, though. He's saying go do something to bring some kind of income in. and the, you, you don't have to go find the equivalent position in another company. Just go get a job to get some income to try and make that savings last even longer. But what about- I, Yeah, I'm out there at Chick-fil-A, my pleasure, and that okay. fast. You know what Keep I mean? Right. Like, I think, or not on Sunday, and you got Sundays off. But yeah. I, that that's what I was talking about. And again, is this the... The uh, pseudo boomer in me, I I don't know, but like my brain, every time I I come to this situation, I'm like, yeah, I'm at Home Depot, I'm putting on I, an orange smock, let's go. I do think this question is particularly hard for you specifically to relate to because yeah. you have, um, if it's not happening, people, if you're listening in in HQ two, this is not happening. But if the doors closed on YML today you would have multiple offers by this time next week. Staples, Office Depot. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I'm like, dude, I can do things. I have no skills. <laughs> no skills. <laughs> <laughs> that's, the, that's the thing. None. Uh, I'll say this. I've been interviewing people for a position here in the last couple months or whatever, weeks. Uh, and if someone has a gap in the resume or if they just went and hustled and did this or that, I would not look down upon that. But I know there's this idea of like, well, what are you doing now? Well, I pull custard at Culver's. I don't know if that's the verb, uh, pull custard. Alas, it wouldn't bother me. <laughs> Dame, have you ever pulled custard? <laughs> nope. Kristen. I am not. <laughs> what happened? <laughs> I don't know what's going to happen next. Um, all right. So the answer to this is, what's our answer to this per- nameless entity? <clears throat> Get familiar with your with your spending. Uh, this is the one thing that you absolutely can do to make sure that you are more stable and prepared in the future. Invest in crypto. Thanks, Doug. <laughs> no, that's not <laughs> it. I'm sorry. We wish you the best of luck. I would go to, I'd be a sandwich artist. 16 to $20 an hour. I think I saw online for a sandwich artiste. That's like 60 bucks every three hours coming up after the break. The biggest waste of money of the week and the news right here on the Pete, the planner show. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I'm Pete, the planner. <laughs> what is happening? <laughs> I don't know. I didn't, I had a weird week. I didn't sleep really well as you, as you may have gathered from our Wednesday stand-up meeting, I just I looked like the the meme of like Kermit as the evil emperor in in Star Wars. I had a hood up, and then like I've come back, come back in person. That was a little bit more of a jarring experience. Oh, you were there in person. I was. <laughs> I was like, I I didn't know how to ask if that's how you normally are at the, the office. <laughs> I was- no, I, I I woke up on Wednesday morning. I went to bed like ten thirty. I woke up at one. And I was it. I was up. And I was just like, Ew. Yeah. <laughs> so welcome to welcome to 40. Mm. Okay. Dame, who's who has the best emoji game in your home? Uh oh. Hello? Me. Oh, oh. me. Whoa, wow. How what happened there? I don't I, know. I was something maybe might have muted my audio. That was Sorry. weird. Oh, I thought I was. You? Yeah, it was, it was this. It was this finger that had muted my audio. Kristen, you or your person who has the best emojis? Uh, me. He's old. Yeah. Okay. You know our our coworker Mary. Great emoji game. Yes. Whew. Killer. Okay. I'm accused of having weird emojis um, by my children. So what do they know? Um, apparently more than me. Let's start the show in three, two, one. This week's biggest waste of money of the week right here on the Pete the Planner show is this little thing here. This is the uh, Mont Grappa uh, Anytime by Paolo Favoretto Perpetual Calendar Pen. Designed to magnify writing moments, the debut luxury silhouette from Progatista, pen collector Paolo Favoretto, augments the essential of the writing with Italian inventiveness. 
An integrated perpetual calendar mechanism optimizes sleek, ultra-efficient form while enhancing function, analog ingenuity to focus the mind and seize the day. This is a pen for important work. So it is a pen, and in the cap of the pen, it's a perpetual calendar. Yeah. So A, this is just stupid. <laughs> <laughs> just like, who cares? <clears throat> um, all right. What are we thinking, folks? I, I, I have to know more. Is, is it battery powered? Is it automatic? Is it a, a wide mechanism? How is this calendar run? Do you have to click it every day? That's a good question. Part of me is just like, you're just clicking. Seamlessly integrated three notch dials adjust date, day, and month with haptics and mechanical locking adopted from our acclaimed ratchet piston fill mechanism. Dame, I think you do it yourself. The, Wait a minute. Is, then it is dumb. <laughs> <laughs> it's dumb either way, but then you have to look at your phone oh, that has right. the date to check to see if the date on your pen is up to date. Wait. Prior to packing, each is adjusted to record its production date. Okay. Wait, so so that means it's not actually automatic. Yeah, it's not because yeah. they take it back and then you get because it, it arrives. Oh, this, this is the best. This is dumb. Okay, Dame, how much is this piece of garbage? Uh, six hundred and fifty bucks. Oh, okay. Oh, um, that sounded like a ooh, you're too low. It so comes I'll... in rollerball and fountain pen. I, of course, oh. am counting the fountain pen. Uh, I'm going to adjust two hundred and fifty bucks. Okay. <laughs> so then, in the middle, four hundred dollars. 2,595 pounds. Wait, I don't know what that means. Whatever. Dame, what's in the news this week? Intel got an eight and a half billion dollar government grant to build chip factories. Time out. What? Granted. Best chips, Pete. Uh, uh, Doritos, Cape Cod. Cape Cod. Doritos, poker, or the sitcom chips? Oh, Ponch and John brought uh -huh. big chaps energy. They'd get on those motorbikes and sometimes they'd protect their loins with like a leather material. And other times they just rode more kind of without That's chaps. That's enough. Okay. I almost, yeah. I almost went a direction Doritos? I didn't want to go. Doritos, poker, or the TV show Chips? I hate that. Uh, oh, <laughs> I hate what, that. What about you? I don't even know what the last thing is that you're talking about. <laughs> I feel very confused. And you guys know I love Doritos and cottage cheese. What do you think I'm going to pick? How about you, Dame? Uh, I'll go with TV show. Okay. Okay. Uh, it's the largest grant awarded so far under the CHIPS Act to spur U.S. semiconductor production, and Intel plans to use it to build and expand facilities in Arizona, Ohio, New Mexico, and Oregon. Intel could also be eligible for another $11 billion in loans under the same legislation, a signature piece of the president's economic agenda that Congress passed in 2022. Okay, I thought that was great too. Uh, <laughs> Can I? <laughs> what's happening? What, what happened to the show? I, You're on Slack. Can I yeah. ask a question? There's sure. three of us. You guys can say things. Very loaded. Yeah, but Dame just read the segment and I don't know what chips are. Um, <laughs> what? what? <laughs> I don't what um oh my that's an image Eric um, Estrada. the intel got grant money from the government mm -hmm. yeah. that seems problematic like my question is like they needed it well they're doing it because there's a lot of concern about sourcing semiconductors from asia and they want this production to be done domestically so that if something happens overseas or we have a little dust up with somebody, we still have access to our oh. own semiconductors. That's why when you said timeout, I said granted. Did yeah. you not catch that? I, I caught it. Okay. Because that was pretty good. It was. It. What else is in the news? Yeah, let's move on from that. That was a disaster. I'm sorry about that. I got der derailed Stop. when we started talking about chips. <sighs> 
All right. Uh, f- after finally recovering from social media barrage over VR goggle mockery, Apple is about to enter a much bigger battle. The Justice Department joined 15 states and Washington, D.C. in suing the tech giant over allegedly monopolistic practices, citing everything from Apple's secret of tap to pay chip to its green text bubbles. The 88 page suit basically is a greatest hits collection of every critic's gripes with Apple and highlights include the App Store, how Apple keeps its systems under lock and key, Apple Pay and more. So what's next? It'll likely be years before we find out if Uncle Sam gets to take a bite out of Apple. In the meantime, the lawsuit means the DOJ, which promised to crack down on corporate monopolies, has now completed its punch card of suing every big tech company, including Amazon, Google, Meta, and now Apple on antitrust grounds. Chris, do you feel better about this republic we live in now after this story? Yeah, I have a lot of peace. I can sleep at night. Can I give a, a news bit gripiness that I've got here for us today? Of course. <clears throat> I am generally in support of various types of student loan forgiveness. I just am. I, I, I am. Especially public service loan forgiveness. I really appreciate uh, President Biden's uh, focus on student loan forgiveness. I find it incredibly sincere that he's continuously taking credit for public service loan forgiveness under his administration. It makes absolutely no sense to anyone who actually understands how any of this works it has nothing to do with him this is this is 10 years worth of payments people are making that just happen to be done while he is the president Kristen, am i missing something here (laughs) um no i think that as someone who is obsessed with uh student loan forgiveness programs no one is more obsessed than me it makes me very frustrated when there is what i feel is misinformation from either side of the political aisle about the programs in general like it's it's very 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 difficult for me when i see like news stories or headlines in the space it makes you think what about think about all the things we don't actually understand because we do understand student loans mm-hmm. that people take credit for and we're just like oh yeah they did that and it's like well did they because you didn't forget everybody's student loans they've been working in public education for 120 months making payments <laughs> and he just happened to have gotten elected i i have no problem with him in general but that is just such an ins- insincere claim that all of these people are getting student loan forgiveness under him it makes no sense yeah, to your point, it's it's very interesting about like what things might I not understand that and no one has the time. No one has the time to be an expert in everything. And so I I'm sure I have tons of of uh bad takes on similar similar news headlines. Dame, do you feel like I'm baiting you? Maybe. Mm-hmm. It has yeah. Peter has nothing to do with him and everything to do with him all at the same time because that's how politics works. That's true. Dame hates everybody, but in a good way, but in a good way. Uh, Time for one last pithy news story for the week. Yeah, sure. Uh, Come with me on a little trip, Pete. Mm. I want you to close your eyes and envision what I'm describing. The lighting is warm and bright. The aisles are broad and shelves display $50 silk sleep masks and soft comforters begging to be touched. Mm. Where are you? First class on a Delta flight. Wrong. That's a deluxe Walmart, Pete. That's the new version of Walmart coming to a town new year. They're they're, they're building 800 locations in the U.S. to improve lighting, add mannequins, lower displays, and feature high-end products. That's right. Racks of blazers and cargo utility pants coming soon to a Walmart near you. High-end Walmarts. Yes. We did it. We did it, Joe. We did it. (laughs) 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 It's amazing. (laughs) All right. Daddy's going to go make some Detroit pizza now. All right. Kristen, good to be with you. Dame, send you good vibes because good vibes are all that's in the budget. I'm Pete the Planner. Pete the Planner Show. <laughs> hey, here's the good news. I'm on a webinar with one of our largest clients in about 12 minutes. I hope my energy's in the right place. I'm sending Molly a message now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. What a weird day. Oh, that was beautiful. We did it, Joe. Oh, man. (laughs) That's great. I got to go. Um, Here's the thing. The next time I see you, I will have consumed a great meal along with Jake Gyllenhaal in the Roadhouse remake. Send us a picture. Of Jake Gyllenhaal. Nah. 
Nah. You like a Jake Gyllenhaal, uh, Kristen? I'm a Swifty. What? What, what does, does that, that mean? I don't know. Oh, no. You're like, geez, toasters are my friends. Like, what? <laughs> I, I don't know. Culturally, how, how are they related? Was, <laughs> culturally, just go talk to Ellie today. Just <laughs> it's she'll fix it. Which song about which song of hers is about him? All too well. Oh. That okay. I, I, Dane, I, Jake I didn't Gyllenhaal? Know. Do you like Jake Gyllenhaal? I, I couldn't pick him out of a lineup. Honestly, I didn't he play Spider Man once? Hmm. James Garfield. There have been several. That's why I'm not sure. Uh, no, whatever. You guys, I have to get on a webinar. I know. <laughs> out in Salt Lake City. So uh, <laughs> I'm good day. Hey, everybody, stay getting money. <laughs>